Hello learners, Namaste. Welcome back to the course on labor welfare and industrial relations. If you have gone through the previous lecture, you would have seen that we have gone through one of the most critical aspects which is intramural labor welfare amenities. So today we will talk about extramural labor welfare amenities. I am Dr. Abraham Sir I am an assistant professor at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So when we look into extramural labor facilities, let's understand this. Though I have introduced you to the concept of extramural specifically in the previous lecture, anything which is there within the campus, within the organization, within the premises of that uh, particular factory or plant, those are intramural, specifically something which is outside, let's say housing uh, help or you know giving some, some land to the worker, all these aspects generally comes under extramural. Let's understand it deeply, extramural facilities for workers, when you look into facilities provided to workers outside the factory specifically, it could be as I mentioned housing, it could be recreation and education, they are all known as extramural facilities. So please note, extramural facilities are voluntary benefits which are aimed to improve worker welfare and upliftment. I repeat, voluntary benefits which aims to improve worker welfare and upliftment. So when we look into extramural facilities, it is, uh, you know, we have to understand on a historical point of view. Earlier, due attention was not given to the provision of these extramural facilities uh, to the workers generally, but now it is realized that these facilities are very critical and uh, for the general welfare and upliftment, they need to provide or the employers need to provide these extramural facilities. When you look into extramural facilities, we have to understand the extramural functions of trade unions. Extramural functions of the trade unions could be understood one based on the educational and the recreational facilities. Mainly, trade unions provide educational, recreational and housing facilities for their members. It could be like the trade unions in the factories also undertake the tasks that are required for the welfare of their members. So it could be as I mentioned education, it could be recreation, it could be housing. So generally the unions raise funds or raise finance uh, to actually provide for their members. So it could be through subscriptions from members or spend them for the welfare of workers. Sometimes uh, it also helps in case of the workers untimely debt. So financial assistance also happens to be one extramural function that is being conducted by the trade union. We should not also forget the essence of promoting cooperation. Let's look into issues like extramural aspects which actually inculcate the spirit of cooperation among members. It could be that the extramural uh, schemes outside the factory premises, be it medical assistance, be it healthcare, education, all these are actually channelized to promote cooperation among the workforce. Extension of let's say medical facilities during sickness and casualties is also understood as an extramural function of the trade union. When you look into extramural services generally, there are many, but we can classify them into some of the main aspects. One is housing. When I'm talking about housing, it is all about subsidized housing development plots, hostels or dormitories for workers. So it is about giving a proper housing for the worker who is working for you without any hesitation on a very sincere note. When you are looking into other aspects, it could be education, it could be related to the child welfare, it could be something related to leave travel, some leave travel allowances or some subsidies related to that. Maybe some interest-free loans. It could be based on some education loan, education for the children, for the workers' children or maybe with respect to the, the interest-free loans towards you know procuring a house or getting a, a vehicle and all the vocational guidance that will come under the education and welfare scheme. When you look into uh, certain uh, extramural services, we should also appreciate community facilities also provided by the authorities generally. It could be based on the employer arrangement or it could be coming from the trade union side. So worker cooperative stories and other amenities outside the factory uh, are also part of or significant part of this community facilities and that will actually lead towards extramural services. When we look into these extramural labor welfare amenities in detail, the most important aspect would be housing. 
So housing for industrial workers has been historically one of the most critical aspect. Let's look into generally the layout, what we see, the timeline. When we are looking into the government schemes, the industrial housing scheme provided subsidies for worker housing. But then the challenges were that slow progress was there due to the low priority obviously given by the employer and lack of land and high cost adding to the whole situation. And finally, what we recommend is increased government responsibility and fiscal incentives for employers. So we have to also understand the role of ILO. Recommendation 115 of the ILO typically states that the housing should be a matter of national policy. So when we look into the Indian Industrial Commission 1918, uh, prior to the independence and the Royal Commission realized importance and the specific necessity of improving housing conditions of industrial workers and suggested various measures. So if you trace back history in 1944, uh, there was a labor investigation committee. The LIC here means the Labor Investigation Committee reviewed housing conditions in all the principal urban areas and found industrial housing far from satisfactory. So they felt a very clear long-term housing policy was the need of the hour, was required. So in 1948, as a result, the government of India put forth the industrial housing scheme. Industrial housing scheme in 19. 48. So when you are looking into the entire scheme, the central government subsidized the state governments to the extent of I think 12.5% on a maximum of 200 per house provided the state government contributed an equal amount. So the response to the scheme to be honest was very poor. The first five year plan that started around 1951 suggested that the central government should take major responsibility for uh, financing the housing scheme. So the moment you involve the, the state government, they were not at par in terms of the revenue. So they were not able to provide that much of support. The subsidized housing scheme for industrial workers were extended to weaker sections of the community also. So when you look into the Factories Act Section 2, whose wages did not exceed, let's say the people whose wages did not exceed 300 per month, uh, till they reached a maximum of 500 per month, the plots, skeleton houses, hostels, dormitories, buildings at subsidized rates were to be made eligible for them. So when you look into the entire scheme, you have to understand that housing has been one of the most critical aspects. But then when we look into the challenges, as I've already mentioned, there is a slow progress. The reason for slow progress of industrial housing schemes were the low priority accorded to it by the state government because it generally the entire labor and labor welfare schemes were ascribed towards a function of the central government. So the state government generally had a detachment towards all the policies that were coming in that line. And there was also issues of non-utilization of allocated funds and even the non-availability of developed land in urban areas. So even development of land was also an extra cost. So the high cost of building material, the lack of capacity on the part of workers to pay even the subsidized rent accounted for the general poor progress of the entire scheme. So employers uh, specifically also uh, who otherwise should be the major stakeholders because everything the government cannot do, the employers also were not very keen. They also did not take any particular interest uh, since they were governed by certain rules with regard to rents to be collected, the municipal taxes, size of houses, etc. So they found it too uh, great a financial burden to actually jump into it. So when you look into the statistics at the end of 1967, what I understand is that uh, of the 1,59,871 houses uh, that were built under the scheme, only 19 percentage were actually built by the employer. So this shows the actual, uh, you know, uh, utilization or maybe the actual involvement of the employer in the entire uh, housing of industrial workers. When you look into the second important aspect, which is education for workers, we see that there are three important aspects. One is worker education, uh, children's education, and a collaborative approach. You look into the night schools, the incentives and trade union led initiatives to reduce illiteracy, all will come under the worker education specifically. So 
education where for the citizen or the industrial worker it should be treated with equal importance that was the, the underlying philosophy since uh, the latter even if he works in a factory has to cope with the change which is most often most often technological so the literate worker is naturally more receptive he can be uh, or she can be a person who can you know change according or adapt according to the change in technology which is going every now and then so educating the workers family especially especially his children if you look into the children's education schools scholarships and transportation provided in industrial townships that were very critical so when you look into the entire the education aspect we have to understand that uh, you know there are uh, parties like the central workers education board which conducts class for industrial workers so that is one of uh, the 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 clear agencies which are actually involved in the workers education employers and workers organizations have suggested that personnel trained by the board should subsequently take up the work of educating uh, the industrial workers with the government financing the project so state government specifically are of the opinion that the central board is already overburdened and not capable of taking on added burden so when we look into the entire education state employers and social welfare agencies should jointly fund education programs there should be a a collaborative approach otherwise the blame game will start and the blame game will go on the provision of educational facilities be it either by the state or employer or jointly will help a great deal in improving the workers commitment and even the sense of belongingness towards the entire organization and give him this certain feel as a spirit of achievement so when you look into the children's education generally per se it is an expensive scheme no doubt about it and hence it needs to be provided for by the state employers and social welfare agencies so these are some of the critical aspect when it comes to the education we have seen the housing and the education mainly as the critical aspect so when you are looking into the labor welfare per se we'll understand and appreciate the fact that when it comes to extra mural something which pops into our mind is housing when it comes to we add another level of thought process into the entire scheme of thing we need a educated worker as i've already mentioned who is more receptive towards every change so it could be technological change it could be change in terms of the work philosophy it could be change in terms of the the work output or the objectives of the entire organization so we need an educated worker for that but when we also look into or we add more of thought into it or we look more deeper into it we'll see that it does not end with housing or education it has another added dimension which is recreation and sports facilities we look into that when you look into recreation and sports facilities workplace facilities are critical community facilities are critical and as in case of education we need to have a collaborative effect because it cannot be you know given into one simple category that okay the state government is going to do uh, you know the employers are going to set idle no this will actually trigger the blame game that has been happening in otherwise the previous scenario of education as well as housing so when you look into the recreation specifically workplace facilities employers provide sports cultural and recreational activities on site specifically so this is something which we have to understand on a on site basis though these are extra mural the recreation facilities happens to be aspect which actually has a more of extra mural arrangement so though there are specifically no statutory provisions in the sphere a good example has been set by many progressive employers both in public and private sector be it tata hindustan liver telco uh, the mill owners association bombay the hindustan steel bhel lic etc so in contrast to the situation let's say if you look into 25 years ago when the provision of facilities for recreation sports and culture facilities was generally made reluctantly today employers take pride in actually uh, you know giving the extra 
uh, curricular achievements of the workers and actually uh, publicizing those things they feel pride and as uh, take it up as a prestige issue so the facilities provided for recreation broadly speaking are you know determined by the resources available for this purpose no doubt about it in the enterprise and the importance accorded to it by the employer if an employer is thinking that you know uh, recreation is is good but is not a vital aspect it's not an essential thing then the always in those facilities you see that the recreation and sports facilities take a back seat the recreation facilities available uh, to industrial workers are much better organized than those at the disposal of you know the average citizen so facilities some, sometimes provided you know at workplace or maybe on a community basis but in some aspects they have to be provided it could be such that let's say the state could organize some recreational facilities for its workers in you know in industrial housing colonies etc nobody is stopping the state from doing that but employers should actually take the upper hand or the front seat in doing this statutory bodies could be constituted by the states to supervise the provision of recreational facilities but when it comes to handling the finances the trade unions could also take the initiative and different other agencies who actually actually represent both the worker and the, the employer they should also come into picture and you know bring out a certain level of plan it could be in terms of let's say an excursion which could be organized with the expenses shared by the state and the employers or maybe youth clubs form to uh, discourage something like laziness and bad habits otherwise you know there are there are aspects or there are uh, situations where the workers idle mind of the workers get into different difficult addictions and those may actually create a lot of trouble so so the employer and the state could come together here and could give establish a help in establishing some youth clubs uh, to discourage laziness and bad habits you know even some subsidized holiday homes as a recreation could also be provided as an encouragement given to you know deserving sportsmen or artists or writers whatever be the case be so again recreation and sports facility also happens to be one of the critical aspect another extramural interesting scheme or service would be transport service for workers now public transport to be improved public transport system to serve industry areas and worker colony so we have a better public transport is always the case that the employees generally feel that they are happy to travel in the growth of industrial uh, states and workshops generally if you observe outside the city has made commuting a big problem a very big problem for workers when you look into the indian scenario since the public transport is not fully developed and hardly efficient Uh, sorry to say that but hardly efficient the fatigue of travel to and from work has a very detrimental effect on the attendance pattern of workers so mainly we see that any any factory you see which is established in a rural area you know one of the biggest what we can see if it would not be fair but generally we we see as an excuse that they didn't get the bus or they did not get the proper transport that's why they were late so this is a fact that you know our transport system is not up to the mark and that that could actually require a revamp so uh, conveyance allowances let's say something like bicycle loans or parking facilities could actually give or improve the entire employer uh, employee relationship in terms of transport services for workers and also it could be that there could be adjusted working schedule you know it's more easy to talk uh, about adjusted work schedules right now because post covid we have seen that the work contracts have changed post covid we have seen that you know the work getting finished is more important than just showing up at work post covid we have observed that you know people who we thought that are less efficient are more efficient at home or in in flexible work contracts or work arrangements this is the reason because they have their own commitments they have their own priorities but if they are given a flexibility in terms of work hours then the productivity is not compromised so this is one of the uh, take away from this lecture also staggered work hours could be one critical aspect whereby you actually bring in an option a flexibility towards a worker that this is a way you can actually think of you know with respect to the travel arrangement i'm talking specifically here but on a larger platform if you look into if the employer is flexible enough to make the work contracts in such a way that there is a flexible arrangement maybe a set of shift type system maybe some people who are otherwise not 
capable or able to come at some point in time they can have a different work scheme or different work time or different work pattern altogether or can work from home all these arrangements all these arrangements without doubt can actually improve the efficiency of the entire workforce so this the discussion i just extended or extrapolated based on the transport service for workers there could be also other extramural arrangements something like the cooperative stores and credit societies something like coupons something like let's say some facilities given to them maybe in a minimized rate or a subsidized rate cooperative stores actually give you high quality goods on a subsidized rate so that will add a certain level of importance to you when you are mingling within the society you know you being part of a particular uh, organization if you are given these uh, fringe benefits if i can use the word then it creates a certain respect within the society it creates a different outlook towards you when it comes to such schemes so very quickly if you look into the cooperative stores and uh, credit societies the cooperative stores provide essential goods at reasonable prices and as i already mentioned generally they ascribe to a higher quality there could be credit societies credit society which which actually help workers access loans and manage their finances during a uh, critical emergency so when you look into these facilities cooperative consumer stores are critical to industrial workers because they are the only way in which the workers can try and safeguard to some extent the real purchasing power of their money and prevent the erosion of their wages so when you look into the history a committee was set up in 1967 by the national cooperative development and warehousing board 1961 for the development of the cooperative movement so the committee recommended a pattern of organization and structure and made suggestions with regard to finance techniques and management of cooperatives so it felt that it should be obligatory made obligatory for employers and industrial undertakings to actually introduce consumer cooperative activities in their labor welfare program so when you look into the indian labor conference ilc 1962 Indian Labour Conference 1962 uh, specifically adopted a scheme for setting up consumer cooperative stores in all industrial establishments including plantations and mines employing around uh, 300 or more workers the employer was to give assistance in the form of let's say share capital working capital free accommodation other amenities including loan so there was also an industrial truce resolution 1962 aiming at keeping prices of essential commodities low by opening a sufficient number of fair price shops and specifically cooperative stores so that the workers were assured of so cooperative stores happens to be a very critical aspect when it comes to the extramural welfare the government support in terms of subsidies accommodation and other assistance for worker initiatives also adds on to this particular agenda when you look into distress relief and cash benefits so this is again another dimension of the extramural benefit it could be ex gratia payments it could be welfare funds it could be government support please understand there are many non statutory welfare uh, amenities available to industrial workers depending upon the the relevance and importance of the uh, employer that he or she or the employer itself the entity attaches to these benefits the ex gratia payment if you look into that employers provide financial assistance in case of death or injury or other emergencies so all these would be a one time payment or something like a pension so it is a gift made by the employer to his worker advances are also given at the time of uh, you know festivals where you know such uh, schemes actually you know bring in a lot of cheerfulness towards the uh, for, uh, to the employees and the employers can actually see uh, increased productivity associated to that so uh, let's look into a case of indian tobacco which gives us some uh, to dependence in the event of the death of their work so that is also followed by many many other mills and many other plants uh, where you know some benefit trust fund is there or staff welfare funds are there you know the life insurance corporation provides a financial assistance in the event of uh, let's say flood famine or fire etc the railways also do have a benefit fund like that most mines have a distress relief fund uh, you know given the hazardous nature of the of the particular industry 
Even you look into the workers' organization, they have constantly stressed the need for distress relief funds in all industries to help workers cope with all such sudden calamities. So, we'll see that the government uh, support is critical. State labor welfare boards can help small-scale units establish distress relief schemes. So, when you look into the, the lecture, we have to understand it is an extension of what we understood in our previous lecture. In the previous lecture, if the, if the topic was intramural, where the entire facilities would have been more of internal or within the premises, this is more of external. This is having more of other dimensions whereby a worker would feel not only safe in the workplace, but also satisfied and more productive and more you know, exuberant and confident in coming to work on a day-to-day -day basis. Anything from housing, anything with respect to health benefits, all adds to a lot of confidence to the to the particular employee. And this is where extramural or the benefits of extramural facilities are being underscored. Please note, labor welfare is not all about intramural. It is not all about extramural also. It's a combination. It's a combination of both intramural as well as extramural schemes. And that is the takeaway you should have from this class. We'll see more into labor welfare in the coming lectures. Till then, take care. All the best. Bye-bye.